Today, Monday, June 10th, the Just Baseball Show. As always, it's presented by who Peter's going to tell you about in a moment, but we are doing the weekend thing with Peter. Roundup. The weekend roundup. Peter was a little sick boy on Sunday morning, so here's what I did. I came home from the ballpark, and I tried to find, like, the hybrid. Because, Peter, I know the idea was, like, didn't you feel like you went a little long last time? That was the issue? Yes. So my favorite part about our audience is that they will give me and you and Aram and all of us constructive criticism, but it always comes from a good place. So I read and saw those YouTube comments basically saying we don't need every single highlight from every game. I came from the place of I want to make sure that everybody listening to the show caught every single thing, but it can get repetitive. I don't know how many people care about a sixth inning RBI single to make the score eight to three instead of eight to two. So moving forward, when I usually do the weekend roundup, it's going to be a little bit shorter. It's going to be the big time highlights. We're going to talk takeaways, all that good stuff. And I appreciate you doing it because, yeah, I've had a horrible day, just felt under the weather all day. So if my takes are a little bit worse, you know why. Normally, they're not very good anyway, but they might be really bad today. Understood. Uh, Peter, it is all brought to us by... Bet MGM, the king of sports books. You can find the link in the episode description. Use code just baseball on Bet MGM when you download on iOS or Android. Why? Well, you get a first bet offer up to $1,500 back in bonus bets. I made a couple TikToks this weekend, one with the Royals as an underdog and one with the White Sox as an underdog. And they were a little tough. They both ended up winning, which I needed desperately. But I told our folks, Perfect time to use the code. If you're not sure about a bet, that's the time to attack on BetMGM because you'll get it all back in bonus up to $1,500 if it loses. Remember, gambling problem, call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. Must be 21 or older. Terms and conditions apply. Understood. So we are going to walk through every series that we had, and I tried my best to keep it concise and find the highlights of each game. So, Peter, I want you to tell me at the very end, If I did an okay job. All right. Let's roll. We start in London town. Mets and Phillies are only two game series of the weekend. I love this London series. Ball flies. It's a band box. They might be using special baseballs. I don't know. Conspiracy theorists stand up. I don't know. Uh, But it was fun. Game one went to the Phillies 7-2. Sean Manaya got killed. Bryce Harper, Homer into the sliding goal celly was awesome. Harper also doubled. Castellanos with a deep drive to left. Uh, that was a great call from Mr. Adam Amin. Deep drive to left field in, in London. Whit Merrifield also homered. Ranger Suarez now 10-1 and one with a 1-8-1 ERA. Five and two-thirds, eight hits, two runs. He punched out six Mets. Game two, that's what made it a split. Mets got a win 6-5. The Mets took the lead with a three-run ninth. Mark Vientos had an RBI single. Pete Alonso was hit by a pitch with the bases loaded. And then JT Riamuto with a pass ball. That was not a foul ball, unlike what happened in Pittsburgh. Then a bases loaded walk in the bottom of the ninth made it a one-run game. We got a bases loaded two to three double play, a little swinging bunt. And uh, it was the run back to touch the plate and then the throw to first to get the two, three double play. That's how it ended. Did you hear the British television call of it? No, I was just listening to the regular one. A regular, Elect- that's kind of a bad way to describe the, it, the American yeah. one. The normal one. Uh, <laughs> no, I, it was electric. It was so much better than anything we have in the States. And like, no disrespect to Michael Kay, but like, that was like the Premier League goal, but put it on a baseball broadcast and it was so much fun. But I love this series in London and the show out in London for this series, for this two game set, unbelievable yeah the international experience um is awesome for major league baseball it spreads the game i just wish that major league baseball themselves would market it a little bit better we talked about the mexico series how a lot of fans didn't even know that was happening and then in this series right we posted graphics we're talking about it but at the same time we're just one podcast major league baseball you want to grow the game right don't just have the games in london make it bigger than this than what you're currently doing because it's not enough. My one big takeaway though from this has nothing to do with the international experience. I just have a question. Would a team want Jose Quintana? 
because I'm looking at Jose Quintana. I just watched another underwhelming start from the lefty. Three and two-thirds, three earned versus the Phillies. He's 35 years old. He's got a 5-1-7 ERA, and the underlying metrics do not look good because he has the lowest strikeout rate of his career, down to 15%, coupled with the highest hard hit rate of his career. So he's not striking out anybody anymore. He's still throwing 90 miles an hour, which is fine if your location is great, but it hasn't, and guys are just barreling up the baseball. He only has three starts where he's allowed one run. Only one of those was six innings or more. He's making $13 million this year, and he's a free agent after the season. Like, what a terrible time to have a bad first half for the Mets. You're probably going to be selling off pieces. And just last year, Jose Quintana was a stud. He's kind of been a stud ever since those, what was it, with the Cubs where he was bad or with one of those teams that he had that rough year, comes back and earns a two-year, $26 million contract. If I'm Steve Cohen and I'm the Mets and I'm calling teams to see if anybody wants Jose Quintana, do you think anyone is picking up that call and saying, yes, we're going to give you a prospect for him? I just don't think so. No, I think it could be similar to the um, I, Mets fans are going to know what I'm talking about. The Tyler Naquin package where it was two like complex lottery tickets for Tyler Naquin. Doesn't that suck, though? I mean, Quintana was signed to be a very solid pitcher. No, he like, yes and no. They paid him 13, understandably so, because of what he's done the last couple of years. But this guy looked dead in the water before 22. Like, going into the 2022 season, we were just like, what kind of signing is that? And then he puts up a sub-3 ERA in 165 innings. And we're like, oh, Quintana's back. But he was hurt last year. You said he was all right. Like, he had a three and a half in 75 innings. Like, I I just don't think Quintana should be looked at as, I would say, blue chip. I don't even know what the step down from blue chip is. I don't I don't even think he should be looked at as a chip. Um if the Mets are willing to eat some of the money, maybe they get a complex lottery ticket, but it's tough, man. Like, I don't view Quintana as a notable name to acquire at the trade deadline. I just keep thinking about how this is supposed to be a bridge year, and it's likely that the Mets will be sellers rather than buyers, but most of the players that they would sell are not going to really be worth anything. They're just in yeah. a really tough spot. Yeah. Um, should we come back stateside? I think we should. To America, Eagle Screech, bald eagle screech. (laughs) Is that a good one? (laughs) No, I couldn't even hear it. That was tough. Um, (laughs) Yeah, that was a little bit better. All right, Minnesota and Pittsburgh. Pirates won this series 2-1. They held Minnesota scoreless for the first two games of this series. Game one on Friday was a 3-0 Pirates win. Mitch Keller went six shutout. He lowers his season ERA to 3-1-6. I think after five starts... It was over five. He's been dynamite his last five, six times out there. Chapman, Holderman, Bednar, three one-hit innings out of the bullpen. Joe Ryan, seven innings, two earned runs, both solo shots from O'Neill Cruz and Connor Joe. An RBI from Nick Gonzalez was the scoring. Game two, Pirates won 4 nothing in a bullpen game for Pittsburgh. Carmen Majinski opened with five up, five down. Luis Ortiz, the long man, four and a third shutout. Ortiz good again. Simeon Woods Richardson, six and a third, one run, only run was a solo homer from, you guessed it, maybe the National League MVP right now, Rowdy Telez. Rowdy had a two-run single as well against Yohan Duran in the three-run eighth inning. That's how the Pirates won 4 nothing. Game three, 11-5 Minnesota. It was not a boat race. Three runs in the first against Jared Jones. Three walks right away from Jared Jones, which was uncharacteristic. They were tied 4-4 after nine. They go to the 10th. Twins had a seven-run top of the 10th. RBI hits from Manuel Margot, Carlos Santana, Carlos Correa. All seven runs came against Ben Heller, who's ERA through two innings in the big leagues this year. Sits at 49.50. Kind of tough. Better than 50. Better than 50, hell of a lot better than 75. Way better Uh, than 100. Is this the Rowdy Telez weekend? What do we got, man? So my big takeaway from this series is, yeah, I mean, to answer your question about the Rowdy Telez stuff, the chants, weren't they chanting Rowdy, Rowdy, Rowdy? (laughs) They were doing the Trey Turner thing. (laughs) A week after they wanted to send him to prison. I mean, isn't that just baseball fans in a nutshell? 
right? You're only as good as your last game. Roddy Tellez could have the worst season. Pittsburgh Pirates fans want him out of the country. They want to send him to the London series and have him never <laughs> return. Then he has a great series, and Pirates fans are chanting his name. And I don't even blame Pirates fans. That's all fan bases in all sports. I just think that's a hilarious thing that sports fans do. My real takeaway is your fault. I'm blaming you because you have been a historical blazer of Jared Jones and Paul Skeens that we just forget that Mitch Keller is awesome. He is one of 12 pitchers with 75 plus innings and an ERA below 3.2. He's the guy. Paul Skeens is amazing. And he's going to be amazing for a long time. Jared Jones is great. Neither of them are aces yet. Can we give Mitch Keller his due? I know that these other pitchers are so exciting. I called Paul Skeens Captain America. But God damn it, can we give Mitch Keller his flowers right now? It's your fault. You're Dude. the reason people aren't respecting Mitch Keller is because of your historical glazing of Jones and Skeens. How much fluid did you lose this a morning? When you were... I told I mean, you my takes are not going to be great, just, but there's a hint of truth in there. the best pitcher in that rotation. There's a hint of truth in there. Oh, if we ask you, Paul Skeens and Jared Jones are Hall of Famers already, and Mitch Keller is just the guy hanging out. They're not Hall of Famers. He's not a guy hanging out. I think all They're three are aces. aces. According to Jack McMullen. All three are ace caliber talents. Uh, okay. I think I have a Joe, question for you. I have eh, a question for you. So eh, since I think, we do this. No, no, hold no. On. You hold on for a second. Since we do this all the time. Since we do this all the time, Jack. Is Joe Jones an ace? Right? He had a bad start. You asked me after a good start. He had a rough start. Is he an ace? I think he's an elite starting pitcher. That was the, that was the wording. No, I think you, no, was, you, no, no, no. Don't walk that back. You said... You either said pocket aces or uh, yeah, or... I think they okay pocket aces. I will stand by that. I think Jared Jones is an ace caliber talent. I think Paul Skeens is an ace caliber talent. I think in the best world for the Pirates, Mitch Keller is the best three in baseball. Like Keller is functioning as an ace right now, and he's throwing as an ace over the last five starts. But I like I don't know but if Mitch keep, Keller is keep, an ace. You keep talking about the last five starts, so like. He has a 3 1 6 ERA this season. Yeah, he's been dynamite. Like, he's been awesome. But he was not good for the first five. I understand, but he's been better than Jared Jones. He's been better than Paul Skeens. Skeens has thrown, what, five games? I'm just saying. I think Skeens... Mitch Keller is still the ace of this team, in my opinion. And we're seeing ace-caliber type pitchers, and you're vaulting them up the elevator and just leaving Mitch Keller to hang out by himself. You're putting Mitch Keller at the kids' table, and you already have Jared Jones and Paul Skeens like serving dinner at the adults' table at Thanksgiving. When have I ever slandered Mitch Keller, man? All I'm Every saying day. is they, they Every have day. three frontline guys. You hate Mitch okay? Keller. They have three frontline pitchers. Is that good enough? Yeah, it's good enough. Also, okay. I mean, this this conversation is probably awesome for Pirates fans because they don't care. This is just great. Oh, well, and we just like gassed up Rowdy Telez for the first <laughs> yeah. time, like ever. Also, shout out the Twins for losing the series. When the Twins are playing bad baseball, it's the worst bad baseball to watch. It's like I so just, I almost watch the Pirates bat and like I watch Mitch Keller pitch and like I'm turning off the game. But when the Twins are hot, oh my God, it's awesome baseball. When they're cold, yeah. it's the worst. They're so streaky. It's crazy. I'm totally with you. All right, let's jump to uh, Cincinnati. The Cubs and the Reds in Cincinnati. It was a four game set. And the Reds took it three games to one. Ooh. Game one, 8-4 went the Reds' way. Seiya Suzuki, Christopher Morel homered, but Javier Assad tagged for five earns in five and two-thirds. Eli De La Cruz hit his 11th homer on the year. Hunter Green allowed four earned in six and two-thirds. Game two, Reds won 3-2. Dansby homered, steal seven innings of three-run ball. But Nick Lodolo was really strong. Six innings, four hits, one run. He punched out seven. There was a two-run double from Tyler Stevenson to highlight the scoring for the Reds. Game three, the Reds take their third in a row, 4-3. Andrew Abbott with another magic act. Five innings, one run ball, five Ks, four walks. The Cubs were one for 14 with runners in scoring position. 
Ben Brown, Jordan Wicks, they were the piggyback, then went seven and a third. Candelario and Friedel both homered against Ben Brown uh, for the Reds. A couple things from that game, actually, but I got to tell you about game four. That's when the Cubs kind of salvaged it and avoided the four-game sweep, or the mop, as our friends at Cespedes Family Barbecue like to call it. 4-2, the Cubs won on Sunday. Frankie Montas lasted four outs, four earned. Carson Spires turned into the long man. Five and two-thirds, no runs, seven Ks. Shota sick. Imanaga. Yeah, he was sick. He was Shota sick. Imanaga, six and two-thirds, two earned, seven Ks, a home run and allowed to Luke Maley. Who would have thought? I turned on I turned on that game because I wanted to watch Shota. And I was like, wait a minute. Carson Spears, like, he's kind of sick. I mean, that, that's just great depth for a Reds team that you know that if a guy like Frankie Montas has a really bad start, you can put him in there. And he can give you a chance to win. Now, did the Reds win that game? No, but they won three of four. And just to have someone like that, I think is is huge for a Reds team. But my biggest takeaway is the Cubs are just not that good. They're just not. Like, they're okay. They're a fine baseball team. And I think I'm coming from a place of, I thought that they would be better. That's why I'm saying this. I didn't have low expectations and they're just kind of meeting those. I had higher expectations for this Cubs team. You bring in Shota. You got Justin Steele. I love Javier Assad. And this Cubs team is 10th in ERA as a staff, which is great. But the rest of the team is just not good. They're 24th in bullpen ERA. Without Adbert Alzali closing, who wasn't even that great. Like, I don't trust... Also wasn't healthy. Exactly. Well, whatever the case may be. Just wasn't good this year. And I don't trust anybody in that pen right now. There was a point where, oh, Ben Brown's in. Perfect. But now Ben Brown's in the rotation, and deservedly so. They're 20th in OPS as an offense. 27th in batting average. And they stink on defense. Negative 10 outs above average as a team. Drinks 24th in baseball. The starters are good. How long is Shota going to have an ERA under two? Maybe longer. Maybe he's the greatest pitcher ever, but history would say that regression is going to come. Now, if he he could post like a 2-7 and win the Cy Young, but that's getting worse from now. Steele's been okay, right? He's not the Cy Young Award winner or at least runner-up that he was last year or third. I don't know what he finished, but yeah. we know what I'm talking about here. Like, Jameson Tyon has a mid-3 ZRA. That shit ain't lasting. <laughs> if you turn on a Jameson Tyon start, he doesn't miss bats. I fell into the trap. I bet Cubs money line with Tyon pitching against the, or no, I bet the under in White Sox Cubs. Tyon gives up 10 hits and five earned to the White Sox. Like I'm just watching him pitch and I'm like, all right, this is the same Tyon who's going to be a low fours guy and eat some innings. Ben Brown, we'll see. We like his stuff, but is he going to keep posting at three, five? I don't know. It's just, they're not that good. And it's disappointing because when the Cubs are good, Baseball is better. Like when they were in that chase last year, that was yeah. so much fun. Cubs fans getting yelling at everybody on Twitter. Cubs Twitter is a, a graveyard right now. And it's disappointing. And the reason is the team just isn't that good. And it's not that exciting. Like Cody Bellinger is okay. Like they just, like Mike Tuckman is the guy in the lineup and say Suzuki. When they come up, it's like, all right, we're going to start hitting now. That sucks. They need an injection of offensive life, and that Ian Happ extension doesn't feel great right now. Yeah, and I was an Ian Happ believer. God, I look like an idiot right now. There were a lot of Ian Happ believers. Yeah. And, you know, like, I like to think that it's been a rough two months, but, you know, we're two months in, and it's been a really rough go of it. And that's the thing. It's like we say we're two months in, and it does feel short, but at the end of the day, like, we're a third, maybe even a little bit farther through the season right now. We are farther. Yeah. Like we we're kind of learning who these teams are. And when I look at the Cubs, I'm just left with disappointment. So that's my takeaway. The Cubs just aren't that good. They need an injection of offensive life. And I think that can happen at the trade deadline. They have one of, if not the best farm system in all of be, baseball. So they're going to be buyers. I think they should. And I have no idea how they're going to go about it, but we shall see. They just paid 8 million a year over five years for their manager. I hope they're buyers. Yeah, me too. Or are they going to buy Luis Robert? Like they need, they need a lot. If so, they bought Luis Robert, that solves some problems. Of course it does. But at the same time, like that's going to 
take a lot of prospects. We heard a report from Bob Nightingale that the White Sox are looking for a Soto package. Mm -hmm. Are the Cubs going to give up all these great prospects? And then what? Like, what does Luis Robert then do for this team? Does he change the fabric of the Cubs in this? Yeah, offense? he offers three years of control of one of the better outfielders in baseball. I understand health. he makes the Cubs definitely better, but like this offense needs like two Luis Roberts. Yeah, uh, or you go They're 20th get 20th in OPS. They're twenty seventh in average. Like they don't hit. Yeah, or you go get a star. You use that top three system in baseball to go get a star, and then you add a bunch of other complementary pieces. Like Elias Diaz ain't going to cost you much. And does he do anything for the Cubs? Yes. He's just Dude, another Gomes, Gomes and Jan Gomes is fine. Last year. I like how do you I don't know, man. I I agree with you that this has been a disappointing start to the year, especially because the offense has been starved of any electricity whatsoever. Like it stinks when your most electric player in Morel has an OPS at 700. Like it really stinks. That's what I'm saying. It's just these players are better than they are playing. And I do still have hope because of that sentiment. The players are better than what they are doing. So I'm not giving up. I just, I keep waiting and I'm just left with lethargy. Like it's just, yeah. And it's disappointing. Last thing. um, I did want to mention Lodolo. Like I'm all for Lodolo being here. And back, like, just stay on the field, man. I love watching you pitch. Stay healthy. Um, What I will say about the Cubs is I was curious how they were going to handle Jordan Wicks being healthy again. And I like this designed piggyback of Ben Brown and Jordan Wicks. Yeah. I think that can work every fifth Two completely different looks, too. Two completely different looks. And they can give you, like, they gave you seven and a third of four-run ball. I think they can do that every time. I mean, if that's happening every time, like how many games are the Cubs with their offense winning of those? If you have offensive life, you can win a a good amount of those games. Yeah, I mean, you got to score five, and the Cubs are not averaging five runs per game. So, hey, maybe they give you seven and a third to three. Like, we'll see. And then that bullpen comes in and gives up more. Uh, It's like, I need better than four earned in seven innings from that. You can control what you can control, and Ben Brown is controlling what he can control, and Wicks is controlling what he can control. It's a very nice way to put it. Yeah, right. Let's jump uh, across town to the south side of Chicago, Mm. where the Red Sox and the White Sox split a four game set. Um, John Triffin said, I feel good. Today's the day going into Thursday's game. Second pitch of the game was hit out and they lost 14 to two. The starting pitcher got DFA the next day. (laughs) 14 to two Red Sox, Jake Woodford, four innings, 10 hits, seven earned. Jaron Duran said on Rafaela four hit days. Rafaela drove in four. Duran, Emmanuel Valdez, and Jamie Westbrook homered for the first time in his career. Game two, skid over. 14 stays there. Good call, Stoney. Garrett Crochet, six innings of one run ball, 10 Ks. Jonathan Cannon out of the pen. Three shutout innings, four Ks. Lou Bob, Gavin Sheets, Andrew Vaughn, all go yard. Lou Bob off Cooper Criswell. Back to Sheets and Vaughn off Greg Weiser. Game three, call it a winning streak. Sox win back-to-back, 6-1 the winners on Saturday. Gavin Sheets had a grand slam off Brian Bayo, whose ERA climbed to 4.78 on the year. Tough look for Bayo. Nick Nestrini, four and a third, two hits, one run. He walked five. He worked around that. He punched out five. Homer allowed to Bobby Dahlbeck, who upped his clip on the year to a buck 59 and then in game four six four red Sox, they salvaged the split tied at four in the 10th inning jamie westbrook had a sacrifice fly rob raff snyder had an rbi single it was a bullpen day for boston chris flexen went five innings two earned for the white Sox. call it a split baby that's a win if i've ever heard it bobby delbeck did not deserve that stray utility man bobby delbeck come on man. he kind of deserved the stray a little bit. We is he were, the most uh, quad A player that we have in baseball right now? I think he, he is. Be. But I, I just could not believe that he is technically a utility guy. Like, he's playing everywhere. <laughs> it's just like, he's, I have no idea why, what the Red Sox are doing. He's played short. He's played outfield. He's played first. I think he's played third. I Whatever. Um, My, I didn't have many takeaways from this game. I just wanted to highlight a guy that 
is having a really fun season, and I think he's going to head off to a contender um, at the deadline. Paul DeYoung, 12 home runs this year, 19 over his past two seasons. He had another one. He's got four home runs in June, couple in this series, and it's looked great. Now, the defense is not awesome, but I just feel... I have a feeling that Paul DeYoung is going to have an important hit in the playoffs for a contender. I don't know who it's going to be for, but on June 9th, you're hearing this on June 10th. Remember I said this, Paul DeYoung is going to have a big hit for a team in the playoffs. It's been fun. It's cool to see kind of a revival like that. I wouldn't use the word fun to describe the 2024 Chicago White Sox. He has been somewhat of a light in a very dark tunnel. He has been a flickering, dim, old bulb that still has something in there. Got 12 jacks, he's slugging 470. I would it's it's a fully lit candle. It's not a so, light bulb, but we got a full candle here. So campfire milkshake one, Paul DeYoung two. There we go. Bobby Dahlbuck, by the way turns 29 in three weeks okay i i didn't know he was that old like frankly i thought he was still like 26 for me i thought he was older i just feel like he's <laughs> you been, thought he was pushing he's 30 i thought he was like 32 he's just been <laughs> bumping up and down from the red Sox for i feel like a decade of just look what he did in the minors and then he goes on the majors that's ah, not that good he's like he's like if the yankees kept doing it with estevan floreal like yeah. every year for a decade that's what yeah. it feels like. It's just the same up and down, up and down, up and down. Understood. Um, San Francisco and Texas in Arlington. Giants get a series win on the road, two games to one. Game one went to San Francisco, 5-2. Logan Webb, again, it's clockwork. Seven innings, two runs, lowers the ERA on the year to 2.92. Mm. Wilmer Flores took Mike Lorenzen deep twice. Michael Conforto had a two-run shot. That was the big difference in the 5-2 win for the Giants. Game two, Giants win 3-1. Spencer Howard went the first four and two-thirds. Bullpen finished the job. Elliot Ramos took Andrew Heaney deep. No extra base hits for Texas in either of the first two games of this series. The Rangers, no extra base hits. The Rangers. And then on Sunday, 7-2. The Rangers got a win. Nathan Eovaldi, seven innings, two earned, ERA now at 2.68 with an IL stint sprinkled in there. Keaton Wynn, four and a third, seven earned. Wyatt Langford tripled, Marcus Semien homered. Langford, Semien, Ezekiel Duran all had two RBIs. I thought this was a really strong series from San Francisco. Absolutely. And my biggest takeaway from this series is Elliot Ramos is the best young player that not a lot of fans know about. He's slashing 314, 405, 533 for a 938 OPS and a 180 WRC+. He's been 80% better than the league average hitter. Six bombs, five doubles in 29 games. He has a 1.7 F4 already. That's higher than Altuve, Vladdy, and just .1 away from Corey Seager. And remember, he's only done this in 29 games. And that's just the bat. How about the defense? The outfield defense in left field has been elite. Three outs above average already, and he has a cannon, and he's in the 76th percentile in sprint speed. So he's a good defender in left. He's got a cannon. He's fast. He's hitting for power, and he's hitting for average. And the cherry on top of the Sunday, higher X Woba than Freddie Freeman, Bryce Harper, and Rafael Devers at 381. I don't expect any of this to slow down. He is doing everything at a great level. What I recommend is you go to Baseball Savant and just look at all the red. The 24 bubbles. years old, look at the bubbles. The red is shit. This guy has been wildly impressive for a Giants team who needed it. Yes, I will say it was very brief in 2022. He didn't you know, really get an elongated shot to prove it, but he got a little bit of a shot in 22. And he was only and then, 22 years old then. I know, I know. And he got a 25-game sample last year, and he was really underwhelming. Hit under a buck 80. OPS was under 540. But this year, it's been a different story. And him and Matos have been that in injection when they need it. My big takeaway here is the Giants, I think, have one of the more underappreciated bullpens in baseball. Mm. Like, as a whole, man, 
I, you know, I love Ryan Walker and like, I know you love Camilo Doval, but even a guy like Tyler Rogers has been performing. I don't understand how he does it, but like he does it. Um, even a guy like Randy Rodriguez has been performing. Like it, they have an assortment of guys that they can turn to at any point, And it feels like they all have an ERA in the twos and low threes. And it's, it's just impressive. Classic Giants team. They always have classic Giants. Fans. Yeah, no, I agree. Elliot so, Ramos though. It's been fun to watch. He has. He totally has. Let's jump to D.C. Four games set. I can't believe I'm saying this, but the Nats took three out of four from Atlanta. Like, let, let's start on that alone before I give the breakdown of the games. The Nats took three of four from Atlanta in early June. Would you have punched me in the face if I told you that in February? You probably would have made a bet, and I probably would have punched you in the face for it because that's what you love. I do love floating the idea of people punching me in the face. Someone's going to do it at some point. Like you're going to do it. Well, I mean, like, you're going to make some off season takes and you're going to get one of them wrong eventually. And like, you're going to get, you're going to get a sock to the face, which is crazy because I'm usually right. Like yeah. I'm almost always right. hundred percent. Always. Uh, let's do the games here. Game one on Thursday, Atlanta won 5-2. So Washington swept the weekend, but the weeknight of this four-game set belonged to the Braves. C.J. Abrams, Lane Thomas, homered. Mitchell Parker, seven innings, two runs. Parker was good. But Hunter Harvey with a three spot in the eighth. I got a text about that from a Mr. Peter Apple. Highlighted by a two-run home run from Marcel Ozuna. Reynaldo Lopez, six innings, two runs, seven punch-outs. Good again. Game two, Washington wins 2-1. 2-1. Chris Sale, seven innings, a two-run ball. He caved 10. It was a real tough luck loss. Jake Irvin, six shutout. Hunter Harvey did not bounce back. Another home run allowed. And that upped his ERA to 306 on the year. So I'll still consider it a good year for Hunter Harvey. Game three, Nats win 7-3. Sean Murphy homered for Atlanta, but Nick Senzel homered for Washington. Senzel finished three for three with a pair of doubles. And a homer, he drove in three. Eddie Rosario drove in three as well. Mackenzie Gore, five innings, two-run ball, seven punch-outs. Game four, Washington finished off the series win, three games to one. Eight-five. Hurston Waldrop made his big league debut. More on Waldrop on tomorrow's show. We're really going to dive into all of the debuts and the call-ups on tomorrow's show. But Hurston Waldrop, three scoreless innings to start his big league career. Then a seven-run fourth inning, all seven charged to him, highlighted by a three-run home run from Kiebert Ruiz. He walked four, he punched one in three and two-thirds innings. DJ Hers went four and a third, two earned runs against him. Uh, this was, I think, an indictment on Atlanta's offense more than anything. That's my big takeaway. The Braves suck right now. They're 15 and 19 since May 1st. They're 27th in WRC plus as an offense since that date. Only ahead of the Rockies, the Nationals, and the White Sox. The team is hitting 224, fourth worst in Major League Baseball. They have the second lowest on base percentage at 285, which cultivates into the fourth lowest OPS at 660. Marcelo Zuna is the only guy who wants it on this offense. He's hitting 312. He's been Awesome. Next best in terms of batting average right now in their lineup, Ozzie Albies at 265 and Jared Kelnick at 265. This just isn't the Braves. It's weird watching them. You watch them last year, they'll hang five on you before you even get to the bottom half of the inning if they're the road team. They were the ultimate, we're scoring a ton early, and then we're just going to bleed you with the bullpen and our starters. And the starters have been good. Right, they're ninth in in ERA as a staff since May first. It's not the rotation, although they've had some rough starts here and there. But that's sure. baseball. The offense is so lame, which is such a weird thing to say about the Braves. I know. I know. Twenty seventh in WRC plus since May first. The Braves, and. You got to factor in that Acuna has been out for a couple, I what, week or so now. But it's not like Acuna was any good when he was playing. Uh, no. That's a little far. I know he was still fine, but he wasn't Acuna. wasn't even close he to was, that. He wasn't Acuna. Riley has not been Riley, and I know that, but he's been hurt a little bit no, too. He's, hit, he's hitting 230. 
I, he probably is hurt because this is very unlike him, but it's just the reality of what's happening. Like we can make excuses for them, which are valid, but the proof is in the pudding. Like the other team, the Nationals don't care that the Braves have some excuses. They're yeah. just going to beat them. Yeah. So yeah, we can contextualize it and say, well, this guy's going to heat up this 27th the WRC plus since May 1st. Yeah. That's just... Like what a 19th, miss. okay, 27th, close to the White Sox. Yeah. Braves fans, you can't let this fly. Cannot. You can't let this fly. I don't know. I don't know what the fix is. Like the fix may be just wait till next year, which is crazy. Go get Jock Peterson and Eddie Rosario again. Maybe yes. Jorge Soler. Why not? That Brought sounds great. Jorge Soler a bit more expensive than he yeah. once was. I know. But still, let, just yeah. run it back. Let's go to Tampa here. O's sweep the Rays in Tampa. Game one, 6-3 Baltimore. Homers from Anthony Santander, Ryan Mountcastle, Jordan Westberg highlighted the charge. Cole Irvin, five and two-thirds, two earned. Aaron Savali, not good again. Five innings, four earned. Bumped the ERA to 5-5-1 on the year for Aaron Savali. Game two, Baltimore blanks Tampa, 5 nothing. Ryan O'Hearn, Gunnar Henderson, Homer. Gunners was a three-run homer. Taj Bradley, Five innings, three hits, one run, seven Ks. It was a good start. He needed a good start. Kyle Bradish is a freaking dog. Six dog. innings, one hit, no runs, no walks, nine Ks for Bradish. ERA on the year, despite dealing with an arm issue at the beginning of the year, sits at 262. And then game three, Baltimore completes a sweep, 9 2 the win. Adley had a six RBI day, including a grand slam. Tony Taters homered again, Santander. Gunner and Westberg double. Kowser, Mullins, and Westberg all triple. Westberg was a homer shy of the cycle. Grayson Rodriguez, five and two-thirds, two hits, two runs, and he punched out six. Bradish, Bradish, Bradish. O's have a freaking staff, folks. Grayson had a five-inning freaking no-hitter. <laughs> or five-inning perfect game before he got into the six and got in a little bit of trouble there. I watched that start. I mean, he was just, I mean, a freaking, when he's on, he's a freight train coming at you. O's pitching or the Rays offense? I don't think anybody could have hit Grayson. Okay. It's just and like, very few are going to hit Bradish. Yeah, exactly. Like, yes, but here's my big takeaway. Similarly to the Cubs, the Rays just aren't that good, which sucks because I, I, I bet on them to win the division. I bet on them to make the playoffs. I bet on them over wins. And I think I'm going to lose every single one of those tickets. They're 26th in OPS as an offense. They're 30th in home runs. They have hit the fewest amount of home runs in Major League Baseball. Zero power. All right, well, the starters are good? Nope, 21st in starter ERA. Well, the bullpen's got to be good, right? Nope. 21st in bullpen ERA. At least are they good at defense? 17th in outs above average. This team's just not that good. So I get what you're saying with Bradish and Grayson. Was it more an indictment on the Rays? Like, yes. Probably a healthy blend With how good they looked. Yeah. I don't know if anybody could have hit them that day. So that's why I'm not taking anything away from them. I'm more talking about the Rays over this entire season. It's just been such a disappointment. And I know, right? We can make excuses. Some injuries here and there. Nobody gives a fuck about any of the excuses. It's good on radio because we can contextualize it and it makes sense and it makes those fan bases feel good about themselves. But here's the reality. On June 9th, this team is under 500 and they're below average in everything that matters. Kind of like the Cubs. It's just, they're not that good. Maybe they buy at the deadline. Maybe all the players start overperforming again and maybe they turn it around. But up to this point, Cubs raise disappointments. I agree with you. I think the star players for Tampa, the quote unquote star players for Tampa have been the reason. And I think in terms of Jersey sales, you'll see more a Rosa Reina and Diaz and probably more Siri than you'll see Paredes. And one of them has been good. This Paredes season. has been like the only good player. Like Yanni has been good, but it's just so many singles. Has he? Yeah. Now it's like, just a lot it, of hard it, hit singles. Exactly. It Like he's been... He, I, what I mean by that is Yanni Diaz is not the problem. 
but he's not, he hasn't been the solution. Yeah, you need your star players to be the solution. Like you need yeah. Randy to be the solution. Randy's been the problem, um, like one of part of the problem. Yeah. Siri needs to be a solution. He hasn't been a solution. Yandi needs to be a solution. Yandi's not a solution. Eflin needs to be a solution. He's not a solution. Exactly. Fairbanks needs to be a solution. He's not a solution. Like it's, you can just keep going too. I I, I, know. I don't I don't even want to keep doing it. Be, but it's the whole team. I only. But East like Dr. those Red are the guys that you good. look at, and it's like, oh, those are the guys I show yeah. up to the ballpark for. The only one that you show up to the ballpark for that has been the solution is Isak Paredes. Exactly. So, it's tough, man, and I I feel for Rays fans and uh, Javon is is the Rays fan that I know. Yeah. Uh, also, the Degen Weekly, two of my gambling buddies. Oh, Rays fan? Huge okay. Rays fans. And, like, I just text them all the time. I'm like, your your team's just shitty. I mean, they're just not – they're not that good. I they're like just... – yeah, I like when you say not that good more than shitty because not that good, like, somehow stings more. They're just not that good. Like shitty, oh. shitty almost sounds like I'm joking. Not that good right. hurts. It's like, oh, oh you're serious, aren't yeah, you? <laughs> that really yeah. hurts. Okay, uh, Cleveland and Miami in Miami. Guardians get a 2-1 series win on the road. Game one went to Miami by a run. Brian Rocchio homered, but so did Brian De La Cruz and Josh Bell. Logan Allen, six innings, two runs. It's really a pen game for Miami. Ryan Weathers opened for two and a third innings. Marlins got the go-ahead run in the eighth on an RBI single from Chaz Jism. Game two, eight nothing Cleveland, six run fifth for the Guardians. J. Raymond Quan homered. Stephen Quan's OPS don't look now; it's at like nine seventy ish. Uh, ben Lively went five shutout with a singular punch out. Talk about an out getter. Might I point you in the direction of Ben Lively? I and love then game, Ben Lively. He's an out getter. He's the new Quantrill man. Yeah. They found another Quantrill. Uh, and then game three, Cleveland won 6-3. A three spot in the seventh put it away. Gabriel Arias, Tyler Freeman, both homered for Cleveland. Jazz and Berger homered for the Marlins. Trevor Rogers, five innings, two hits, one run. But the three spot came against now the short end of the J.J. Blade trade, A.J. Puck. Yep. I uh, posted about that on Twitter. We'll uh, talk about that trade maybe in another takeaway for another series. Uh, uh, but my takeaway... From this series, you mentioned him. The Ben Lively story is so <laughs> fascinating. So from 2017 to 2019, 20 starts. Three years span, he made 20 starts to a 4.80 ERA. He goes to the KBO and then comes back in 2022. He signs a minor league deal with the Reds and spends the entire 2022 season in the minor leagues. Gets called up in 2023 for the Reds at 31 years old and puts up a 5.38 ERA. Now, after hearing all of that, who in their right mind would pick this guy up? He got another chance and blew it. But the Guardians saw something. They didn't sign him to a minor league deal. They signed him to a major league deal. Now, the money was only 750000 but I thought that was interesting. Yeah. And then... This five inning shutout lowers his ERA to two five nine. This is awesome. 32, 33 year old Ben Lively just getting outs. And you know me, I love my get outs, guys. You know, Big velocity is fun. Strikeouts make me uh, make me all tingly inside, but God damn it, getting outs, just good old fashioned baseball. Makes me want to go look up 1880s underhanders and just look at some of the innings to strikeout ratios. They're striking out one guy per nine innings. But putting up a two seventy, right? Like that. Yeah, I I like that. That's I like it. <laughs> I like okay. it. I I like it. Um, <laughs> I, I was looking at Robin Roberts the other day, Hall of Famer Robin Roberts, um, second in MVP voting in nineteen fifty two through three hundred and thirty innings, four Ks per nine. Electric, dude. It, in nineteen fifty two, dude had a two five ninety. All right, twenty eight and seven. He threw, what is this, 30 complete games, four strikeouts per nine. I was doing um one of those, like, dives because I was not feeling well. So I jumped on baseball reference, and I was looking at older <laughs> yeah, pitchers. That, no, that's way better for you than ginger ale. No, I agree. And, dude, Steve Carlton is <laughs> – He's he might be the most underrated pitcher of all time. <laughs> Dude, he's won 300 games. He had 3,000 punch outs. I know. It, his stats are <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, they're just – and he doesn't get talked about ever in best pitchers conversation. So I, I, want, I want a late-night answer to this. 
best four-year stretch in baseball history. Sandy Koufax, when he won his four straight Cy Youngs. Pedro Martinez, I think it was 99 through 01 yeah. or 98. Pedro through doing that in the steroid era. Well, and then Randy Johnson, similar timeline too. So look at those three. Randy Johnson's four-year stretch, Pedro Martinez's four-year stretch, and Sandy Koufax's four-year stretch, and tell me which is the best four-year stretch of all time. You just gave me homework, and I'm going to do it. Homework. Okay. Let's go to Detroit, the Motor City, man. Hey, thoughts on those uh, City Connects for Detroit? Um, Fine. I go C-. minus. Yeah, fine. I mean, slightly, pretty underwhelming. Slightly below yeah, fun. Motor City. Like, okay. I, City Connects have not been great this year. Nah, I like Tampa's. Yes, some, yeah, yeah, I agree. Some are good, yeah, but yeah. the overwhelming majority are mid. Whatever. Uh, Milwaukee won this series 2-1 on the road. Game one was the Tobias Myers game. 10-0 Milwaukee, Tobias Myers. Eight innings of one hit shutout ball, punched out five. Reese Olsen, four innings, 12 hits, eight earned. William Contreras, Joey Ortiz, Blake Perkins, Bryce Terang all have two RBIs in the effort. Game two, Milwaukee won 5-4. Freddie Peralta walked five in three and a third. I'm disappointed, Freddie. Casey Mize, five runs, three of which earned in five and a third innings. Tigers were up 4-1 after two, scoring halted there. No extra base hits through the first two games. Jackson Chorio, Christian Yelich, two RBIs apiece. Game three, Detroit... Salvage avoided the sweep 10 2. This was the Tarek Schoolbull game. Six and two thirds, one run, two walks, 10 Ks, hit 102 miles an hour. Tarek Schoolbull, eight and one with a 192 ERA. Mm. Jake Rogers homered, Riley Green a pair of doubles. My takeaway from this is that Tarek Schoolbull is officially the best left hander in baseball. And I think that title has changed hands several times over the last few years. Like last year, Shane McClanahan, I thought through the elbow injury was the best left-hander in baseball. Now it's Scooble. Okay. I was going to frame it in a different light. I was going to call him the best pitcher in the American league right now, because look what Ranger's doing. I know, but is Ranger hitting two? I know it's flashier and more fun to watch Tarek Skubal but Rangers got a 1-8 like he's yeah but like Skubal has a 1-9 <laughs> I know but he's also pitching in Comerica like I agree with you I think Skubal is more talented than Ranger Suarez but god damn it Ranger is amazing but regardless the ninth rounder out of Seattle University is one of the best pitchers in Major League Baseball what do you want your pitcher to do? You want him, preferably, if you could build a left-hander in a lab, you would say, I want a lefty that throws in the mid to high 90s. I don't want him to walk anybody. I want him to strike out everybody. I want minimal hard contact, softest contact possible, and I want it on the ground. He's in the 94th percentile in expected ERA. He's in the 88th percentile in K rate. He's in the 91st percentile in walk rate. He's in the 92nd percentile in a hard hit rate, 64th percentile in ground ball rate. If you were to build a lefty in a lab, it would look a lot like this six foot three, 240 pound, 27 year old dicing up any offense he finds at any given time. The Brewers are great. It was a great offense. Yeah. He made them look like shit. Now, I know William Contreras wasn't in the lineup in that game. Who gives a shit? Who cares if he was? Scooble doesn't care. He's going to shove every freaking game. Doesn't walk anybody. He's consistently in the zone with electric stuff. And when you do make contact, it's soft and it's normally on the ground. And most of the time you don't make any contact because you're sitting your ass on the bench after he just sat you down with multiple different pitches that are all awesome. He's at the top of his game right now. This is the prime Scooble that I bet the Cy Young ticket on. And we were talking, right? These odds are terrible. He's up there with some of the best pitchers in the American League. And I said, I have to try. Like, even if it loses, whatever, I understand it's a bad value bet. But God damn it, did you see him last year? And then he's just, he's been better than I had my wildest dreams about. Like, if if you told me on June 9th, he'd have an ERA at 1-9, 
I'd be like, okay, like stop joking with me. And here we are. I'm just I'm looking at like the side by side and it's ridiculous how close they are. Uh innings pitch, Ranger has started one more game. He's six innings ahead of Scoobel. So like pretty much a wash at this yeah. point. Ranger's got a one eight one. Shit, he's ten and one if we want to look record. Scoobel is what seven and one with a one nine seven. Scoobel ten and a half Ks per nine, one and a half walks per nine, one point six. Ranger, nine and a half strikeouts per nine, one point nine walks per nine. Opponent OPS. Opponents are hitting 181 with a 518 OPS against Ranger. Opponents are hitting 191 with a 523 OPS against Google. They're the same guy in different leagues. One of them throws 102. I'm just going to side with the guy that throws 102 and walks fewer guys. But isn't that just awesome how there's multiple ways to skin a, what is this, skin a cat? Is skin that, a cat. Yeah, that's the that's term. That's a horrible term. It, it is a brutal term. <laughs> it's a brutal term, but it, I'm using it here and I think it makes sense. There's multiple ways to get batters out. You could you know, throw a 98 I, at the top of the zone with just hammers and change-ups, or you could just be that smooth criminal who's thrown in the low 90s, throwing it wherever he wants. My favorite part about watching Randy Suarez is watching him field, honestly, like even more than watching him actually pitch. Surveys his kingdom. Yeah, he's 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 the best fielding pitcher I've ever seen. And I know there have been a lot of great ones, but... And maybe the numbers would say I'm wrong, but I don't care. My eyes tell me he's the best pitching fielder I've ever seen. I wasn't uh, sure if it was skin a cat or skin the cat. Inter- interchangeable. You can go okay. with either, but like still weird on both ends. Might never use that term again. Yeah, but like I could appreciate how you used it and it was the right place to use it. And I I rock with it. Let's jump to Kansas City where the Royals got a 2-1 series win over Seattle. Game one was an all-timer. 10-9 Kansas City got the win on Friday night. Seattle was up 7-0 after a half inning. They led 8-0 through three and a half. Kansas City got four in the fourth, three in the sixth, three in the ninth to win it. Bobby Witt Jr. had a ninth inning triple. MJ Melendez had four RBIs, including a three-run homer off Bryce Miller. Daniel Lynch stunk. Like eight earned, six hits, four walks, and four innings. Frankly, he didn't look good in AAA when I saw it, and that's really sad because I had super high hopes for Daniel Lynch, but those are quickly kind of fading. But hell of a comeback effort from Kansas City. That was as exhilarating a comeback as we've had in baseball this year. Game two, Kansas City wins again, 8-4. Adam Frazier homered. I don't know if it was 108 and 450 like he did against me and MLB The Show. Kyle Isbell drove in three. Vinny had two RBIs. Luis Castillo, five innings, five earned. I know the ERA sits in the low to mid threes right now, but it was really rough. A couple of awesome starts. And then this one is like, what do we got here? Game three, six, five Seattle. Three guys homered, Melendez and Renfro for Kansas City. JP Crawford for Seattle. We went to extras tied at three. Kirby and Reagans, the starting pitching matchup. Combined for 13 innings, two earned runs, eight hits, one walk, 13 Ks. Julio and Cal Raleigh had RBI hits in the 10th. That gave Seattle the 6-5 win. So, again, 2-1 Kansas City. It was really all about the comeback on Friday. My biggest takeaway is that the Royals are the most fun team to watch in Major League Baseball right now. And I think you could say, well, the Orioles have been awesome, and you'd be right. The Yankees have been unbelievable. You'd be right. Dodgers, Guardians, Brewers. Watching this young Royals team, the never say die attitude, they're top 10 in OPS, they're top 10 in starter ERA, and they just, you can never count them out. And there's something about playing in Kaufman that they are just almost unbeatable. They're 24 and 11 at home. Whenever you get them in Kansas City, you can always expect, and it doesn't matter who. Like, remember I was talking about that underdog bet that I was like, it's probably a good idea to use Code Just Baseball and bet MGM. It was Alec Marsh against Luis Castillo. Yeah. And I bet the Royals as the dog. Because I said to myself, yeah, Castillo's awesome. But it almost doesn't matter. They, in that game, they won 8-4. to four. Every single time Seattle scored, the Royals scored in that exact inning. Right? First inning home run from J.P. Crawford. By the way, he hit he hit a leadoff home run in two of the, what, three games in the series? Shout out J.P. Yeah. Crawford. Royal score in the next inning. 
Mariners go up a little bit, Royals then score again. Mariners go up a little bit, Royals score again, and then they just win the game, 8-4. to four. As soon as you put up runs on this team, they're going to battle back. They have been so much fun to watch. So uh, It's not like a statistical analysis. It's not any of that. It's just I am having the most fun watching the Royals of any team besides my Yankees, obviously. Yeah, the Yankees, the Phillies. Like, I have so much fun watching the Phillies. Oh, yeah, I'm they're awesome. Them. But it's 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 almost like context is important, right? Because, yeah, we know how good the Phillies are. We've been watching this Phillies team now for yeah. a while. But we haven't seen this from the Royals. It's just a youthful, fun energy where you can tell they're all playing with nothing to lose. Yeah. And it's just feel-good, loose baseball, and it's it's awesome. That's kind of how I felt about the White Sox for these two games this weekend. Oh, yeah. Youthful, exuberance, a happy-go-lucky attitude, Martin Maldonado, an all-star. I Let's go to- I'm proud of you for still watching. I, I don't watch. <laughs> I I watch the highlights. I don't watch anymore. Uh, let's go to Colorado and St. Louis. In St. Louis, it was a four-game split. 3-2 Colorado. Uh, they got the win in game one. Sonny Gray, four and two-thirds, three earned. He walked four. Run came in on a wild pitch. Cal Quantrill, five innings, no runs, four walks, 1K. Doesn't matter. Cal gets it done. Out getter. Singles, ground outs, a wild pitch. Small ball wins. Colorado got the W. Game two, 8-5 St. Louis. A three-run eighth put it away for the Cardinals. Dylan Carlson drove in three to get him his first RBIs on the year in his 57 at-bats. It upped his OPS to 488. Game three, 6-5 Colorado. They got the win. A three-run seventh blew a hold for Andrew Kittredge. No hold for him. (laughs) This was the Zeke Tovar game. Ezekiel Tovar, four for four, four RBIs, a multi-homer game. Colorado won game three, six, five. Game four, St. Louis wins 5-1. Andre Palante, because of course he did five shutout innings, six Ks as a spot starter. Dylan Carlson doubled again. Alec Burleson, his ninth homer. Carlton is like, Carlson is, is he a space waster at this point? Is he a what? Space waster. This whole Cardinals team feels like space. <laughs> yeah, they do. It's I mean, crazy it's... that like there's this clumping going on in the NL yeah. Central where two through five are all stacked by like a game right now. And for the Cardinals and the Cubs, it's so disappointing. And for the Reds and Pirates, they're like doing backflips. It's like, hey, we're contenders. Yeah. It... Like, is Dylan Carlson a space? Like, kind of. I It's... I I barely watched any of the series. <laughs> yeah. I'm so uninterested in this series. Yeah. Because what am I watching anymore with the Cardinals? What am I turning on anymore, Cardinals fans? What? It's the same thing. I got and, excited for Sunny start. I got excited yeah. for Sunny and Cal Quantrill. And I, but like, I agree. I turned on the Sunny start. How'd it go? Not good. It's just... It's so disappointing. Because, like, I weirdly am a Cardinals fan. I... I like them and it's just like it's just like I don't know I just like them I, I like, like when fan base I like their fan base I love hopping on Cardinals radio and talking to those guys I just for whatever reason rally behind this team and they just never freaking help me do anything um one of the haters gonna um acknowledge that Cal Quantrill is actually very good I think they're already doing it are they not they're not enough not enough people have come around. No, I mean, you've realize, always said hey, this. You've always said this. When he's good, they're silent. They're dead silent. Yeah. Can't hear a peep. So, Can't like, what do you want? Pimp-drop. You want to, want to get flooded and be like, you know what? You were right about No, Cal. I don't even want people to say I'm right. I just want people to start, like, tweeting about it, start talking about him. Because every single time he does, like, oh, he escaped. Since 2019, he's got a 3.80 ERA and 640 innings. At what point is he just good? He's got a 3-5 ERA this year, pitching on the moon. At what point do you say that year of the 5 ERA was the outlier when he was hurt that year? And every other year, he's been in the mid-3s or below. He's had multiple seasons with an ERA under 3. 
at what point do the haters say the the underlying metrics are not perfect and you have to just watch this guy get out? At what point do they do this, Jack? At what point? I, I don't know. Can I say something? Um, 186 innings in 2022. He was 15 and five with a 3.38 ERA. By war, he's better this year. By B war, he's better this year. He put up a 1.8 win season that year in 2022. Somehow, he's at 1.9 at this point. And I don't know what goes into the B war soup for pitchers, but like, Somehow he's been more valuable in fewer than a, or I mean, fewer than half the innings. 73 innings this year, 186 last, or in 22. I don't know what Corey Seager's B war is, but I know his F war is 1.8 and Cal Quantrill is a 1.9 F war or B war. So, yeah, is Cal Quantrill better than Corey Seager? The numbers would say yes. It probably. A lot of people are talking about that, actually. More people need to. Yeah. Ezekiel Tobar is here. Uh, Adeel Amador is going to take some time for him to be here. I don't think he's here yet. Uh, we'll talk about that on tomorrow's show. But Ezekiel Tovar is here, and they've got the shortstop of the future in Colorado. I think that became abundantly clear this weekend. If you didn't already know it, I knew Rockies fans did know it. But, like, the baseball fan should start looking at Ezekiel Tovar when you're fantasy drafting or, like, hey, Rockies are coming into town. You'll be impressed by this shortstop because yeah. he's really coming into his own. Glad you mentioned that 100%. He's, like, one of those guys where, you know, you – you root for your team and a team comes in and maybe you don't know much about them. He's one of those players that might get you to go, Ooh. Yeah. They've got this kid Tovar that can swing it. Like it's that, that kind of thing that the old heads say, Oh, they got this kid Tovar 22 year old. And they're right. The old heads are right. He can swing it. He can swing it. He's hitting 294 with an 813 OPS. As, as a right stop. And he's a good defender. He's or at least really it will good. be one day. Yeah. Is he grading out poorly? Um, I mean, I could do a quick check. Um, Ezekiel Tovar in terms of outs above average is in the 96th percentile. He's there got five go. outs above average already. Arm strength, eh, middle okay. of the pack, but still. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. been great. He's been good defensively this year. Big W. Arizona, San Diego. We've got, I think, four more series. Arizona, San Diego was a split, four game set. Game one, 4-3 Arizona. Gino and Gabby Moreno go back-to-back in the second against Randy Vasquez. Slade Ciccone went four and a third, three earned, but the pen goes four and two-thirds scoreless for Arizona. They needed that bad. Kyle Higashioka went yard, but Jeremiah Estrada allowed a run. What happened? ERA ballooned to 0.95. He got a loss in that one. Game two on Friday, 10-3 San Diego. Tatis and Profar. Two of your starting outfielders in the National League go back to back in the first off. Brandon fought. They were off to the races. Profar had four RBIs. Campy and Hassan Kim, two RBIs apiece. Cattell Marte, Lourdes Goriel Jr., homered. Not enough. Michael King worked five scoreless as the San Diego starter. Game three, boat race, 13 to 1, San Diego. Kim, Cronenworth, Higgy, Homer. That's back to back games with a homer for Kyle Higashioka. Kim and Cronenworth had two had three run shots. Ryan Nelson and Logan Allen got killed. Matt Waldron kept the ball in the strike zone. Just two walks, one run, six innings. You love watching Waldron. We can get to that in a moment. Game four, 9-3 Arizona to earn the split. Tatis and Profar homer again because, of course, they do. But Adam Mazur got roughed up. Three innings, eight hits, eight earned, three walks. I think that's like half his minor league walk total this year. Lourdes Gurriel, Jake McCarthy, Jock Peterson all had two RBIs. McCarthy had a two-run homer off Mazer. Waldron's start was the most compelling for me. Like, if that guy's only walking two, buckle up. It's really hard to find the strike zone with that pitch. I'm so glad you brought up Matt Waldron because that was my biggest takeaway. Lowers his ERA to 3.76 with an expected ERA at 3.28. R.A. Dickey threw his four-seamer in the low to mid-80s. Waldron averages 91. Yeah. So when you see that knuckleball and then you see 91, 91 has to look like 98. And the sweeper, they say he throws it 19% of the time. It's a complete lie. Half of those are knuckleballs, at least, that qualify as sweepers for whatever reason. And that's how disgusting the knuckleball is. He's throwing it for strikes. And it's dancing. And then he's got 91 in his back pocket. He's really, really hard to hit. 
And it's so fun watching him operate ABs because like he's throwing like on a hitter's count three, one, he'll throw a knuckleball for a strike. And it just, it, you could tell it just gets hitters out of their comfort zone. Like you're sitting dead red three, one, and you get a knuckleball that's dancing. What are you then reacting to? You, are you sitting heater and reacting knuckle? There's no other pitcher right now in Major League Baseball where you have to make that adjustment. No wonder he's been so good. And I'm so glad you brought up the walks because if he can be in the strike zone, he's going to be a good pitcher. And he's been in the strike zone. Like, exactly. Through his first 110 Major League innings. Fewer yeah. than three walks per night. Yeah, Matt Waldron is on my top five list of guys who I'm turning on to watch right now. I, that and he's fun. Like he's a five. You know what I mean? Like he's got an ERA in the high threes right now. I think I've watched like nine or ten of his starts this year. I think he's I, made thirteen. I think I I've watched it. almost all of them. It's fun. It's legit knuckle, fun like, to watch a, him. A knuckleball being back is like very yeah. enjoyable, especially very when it's good. like a hard one like this and a guy that throws it consistently. Um, Toronto and Oakland Blue Jays got a road series win two games to one game one the J.J. Bleday game two one A's J.J. Bleday with a walk-off homer Chris Bassett eight innings of one run ball the only hitter that the Blue Jay bullpen saw was that leadoff homer from Bleday in the bottom of the ninth inning Hogan Harris went six shutout that's the highlight from that game we're going to talk about this game in, in a moment Game two, Toronto Blakes, Oakland, 7 nothing, Five run fifth, put it away. Kevin Kiermaier went yard. Bichette had a pair of doubles. Kevin Gosman, a complete game shutout with five hits, one walk, 10 Ks. And then in game three, 6-4 Toronto. We went to the 10th, tied at three on Sunday. A three-run top of the 10th was a bases-clearing double from Isaiah Connor falefa Mitch Spence, seven innings, two runs for Oakland. The Blue Jay bullpen saw one hitter in the first two games of this series, and they fucked it. <laughs> Man, you hate to see it. Um, two takeaways from this one. One is a quick one. I think that Gosman start is going to start to get him to roll. It uh, If that's not going to get him right, I don't know what's going to get him right. That's what I was about to say after that. If, if this one doesn't start to get him going, <laughs> then I don't know if anything will, because that was vintage Gosman. That's the splitter working. That's the fastball at the top of the zone. That's throwing it wherever he wants. That's the ace. There it is. We saw it. And we've seen spurts of it, but really not much. That was Kevin Gosman. That was the guy who can win a Cy Young. Now, will he this year? No. But if he can put together some more of those Kevin Gosman-esque starts, Blue Jays are in a much better spot. Uh, my second takeaway was... The J.J. Blade for A.J. Puck deal is going horribly for one team and great for the other. Yeah, and last year that was not the case. That was not the case. This year, A.J. Puck is a 7-3-0. You have three earned. We talked about it in that Marlin series. Um, and J.J. Blade, it's more, it's not like, oh my God, A.J. Puck is so bad because he's just been banged up and it's tough. But J.J. Blade, 129 WRC+. plus. He's got a 1.5 F4. Second among all center fielders qualified. Tied with, if you can guess who he's tied with, I will Venmo you $5 right now. Center field F4? Center field F4. Who is he tied with second? Number one is Aaron Judge at 4-7. <laughs> and second is J.J. Blade and at 1-5. Can you give me a league? National League. Not Marsh. No, but it has to be your first guess to get the Venmo. Ah, uh, damn it. Okay. Um, but all, it's not Marsh, and Marsh plays left anyway. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so oh, shit. It's 924. I'm tired. Yeah. Two weeks home stand. Um, one real guess. I don't know. Blake Perkins. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> no chance. The Brewers. That's been no great. Chance. No, I just, uh, crazy. Blake Perkins. Um, but yeah, JJ Blade has been awesome and it's great. It's cool to see that. Like that's, those are the baseball stories that I enjoy. A guy who gets picked really high, struggles with his team, gets a new look. He's in a new place. You go from Miami to Oakland across the country. 
and you get kind of this new fresh start. Not a lot of pressure, and right now he's balling out for an A's team. It's cool to see. 100%. All right, let's jump to Houston and L.A. This is our penultimate series that we have to go over. Astros take this series in Anaheim two games to one. Game three was pretty cool. But game one, 7-1 Houston from Valdez. You want to talk about complete games. He goes the distance, four hits, one walk, eight Ks, got through nine on 106 pitches. Only run was a solo shot from Kevin Pillar. Yaner Diaz, Jose Abreu go deep. Jordan drives in three, one, one through six before a five run seventh. Game two, Houston wins 6 1. Hunter Brown, six shutout innings, two hits, seven Ks. He walked four. And I'm going to talk about Hunter Brown here in a moment. Jordan had a three for four day with two doubles and a homer, including 103.9 on the way in from Ben Joyce, which is like, holy shit, out at 106 the other way, like down the left field line for a double. Absolute freak show at bat, absolute freak show pitch and result from Ben Joyce and Jordan Alvarez. Game three, nine, seven angels. Logan Ohapi, was it caught by cabbage? We didn't know for a moment, but a walk-off two-run bomb. Ohapi had it off Josh Hader after Ryan Presley blew the save. Hader got the loss. Jose Altuve homered and drove in three. I am omitting Abreu from my Houston bullpen complaints moving forward. Abreu was flawless on Sunday, lowered the season ERA to three after a, or under three after a rough start. Presley's ERA is in the fives. Hater's ERA is in the fours. These guys have coughed it up time and time again this year. It's so hard to watch these two vets that we heralded as two of the top five closers in Major League Baseball as recently as like two years ago, even last year at points, do this. Hunter Brown, I will take like any moment to victory lap on Hunter Brown if I can, because it's been so disappointing this year. And he was like the one guy that I was banking on the breakout. I know he went six shutout. I was uncomfortable the entire time. Like the amount of non-competitive pitches that I saw from Hunter Brown was insane to me. The strike rate was under 60% as a whole in that start. How he got through six shutout, I think was more of an indictment on the Angels offense than it was a testament to Hunter Brown. Like it, something's just not right. And I, I don't know what it is because I was sold on the stuff coming into this year. At least the production's been good. 11 8, 4 ERA in April is not going to help. 3 4 2 ERA in May, and he's got a 2 2 5 in June. Six shutout innings against the Angels. I agree with you. Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to combat you and be like, oh, well, look at the number. No. When you watch Hunter Brown, like, it doesn't look like the same Hunter Brown, but like the results have been better, but this still doesn't feel like he's fully back. My second takeaway was man, if Logan Ohapi was a good defender, he'd be a defender definitive top five catcher in this game because the bat is awesome he's got a 111 wrc plus this year he's 24 years old he's got 22 home runs in 105 big league games with a 109 wrc plus and remember you, you hear 109 111 you're like yeah remember his catchers it's well above average for a catcher but he's not a good defender but again he it's it's early on in his career it almost i'm not comparing it to will smith of the dodgers because will smith coming up had a better bat than logan ohapi but we saw when Will Smith came up, the arm wasn't great, was not a good framer, but he was such a great bat. Now, Logan O'Hoppy is a step down in the bat department, but I think if he can get in the lab like Will Smith did and work on that defense, become a better receiver of the baseball, improve that pop time, be a better controller of the run game. Like Will Smith doesn't have a cannon, but his release is so quick, and that's why he's one of the best nabbers of base runners in Major League Baseball. I think he's already nabbed 10 this season. So if Logan O'Hoppy can get back in the lab, I'm not sure it's going to be the Angels lab. It might have to be a a, a secondary coaching option. Yeah, like a tread. <laughs> exactly, or <laughs> something. Like but he has so much potential as a catcher. And my last takeaway is I have never been more surprised about a team in doing this podcast than the Astros this year. I mean, what the fuck? And they won this series, and you're saying that. Yeah, I don't care. That blown loss to On not Sunday. sweep was just 
I'm so upset. I was invested in the Astros, and I'm just like, this is crazy to me. Yiner Diaz is here, right? We get rid of Martin, Martin Maldonado. We have a better catch now. Chaz McCormick takes that next step. Jake Myers is a good option in center field. You still got the four horsemen at the top of your lineup. Bregman in a contract here. Kyle Tucker potentially makes that leap to MVP. Jordan's going to hit 50. Altuve still doing his thing. We got so many starters. We signed all the best relievers. And Nine games below 500. What the? F- this team put the Rangers to seven. And then the Rangers dismantled the Diamondbacks. The Astros could have won the World Series last year. Ugh, what a disappointment. What a disappointment. So, have you ever been more shocked by a team in the time doing this podcast? I, I'm pretty I can't sure. remember I'm, one. I And I know they're like seven or eight games over 500, but I'm pretty shocked about the Atlanta Braves at this point. And I know that injuries... They're like 35 and 20, and they lost Strider and they lost to Cooney. I, I, know, I know what you're saying, though. Like, those stats I read off are crazy. Yeah. But, like, they're still going to make the playoffs and going to be fine. Like, the Astros... The, they're battling to like with the A's. I know. I so I think the right answer is probably. I'm trying to think. Is it? It's not the 23 White Sox. It'd be the 20. Yeah, I guess it would be the 23 White Sox. Like I was very surprised by the 23 White Sox when they had all of those guys like going on, and I I thought there was something like good there. Yeah, I mean, no, that's like fair. that's fair. The 22, like how they finished 500 was kind of crazy, but um, yeah, no, I this is shocking to me. And we were talking about this bullpen tree on the back end of being like all time, and all time. I mean, Presley, haters, hater, like haters, such a loaded conversation. I and know. I don't mean to ignore it at this point, but hater is just like, we you know, we're going to talk about this guy like he's invincible and that he's not. I know it's. Presley's the one that's like really disappointing to me. Yeah. Because he looks like he's gotten worse. Hater, it's just like, oh, like they keep clipping him. That's crazy. Presley, it's just like, dude, like it feels like you're on the downhill now. Yeah. I just last like, it's so yeah, hard to believe. I just I cannot believe it. And I still am a believer. Yeah. It's just last, they're too good of a team, but they I, suck at the same time. It's I, I can't believe it. I know. Last thing I want to do uh, on this series is like push back on the Ohapi spin zone because I love the spin zone where it's like, oh, he can follow the same path that Will Smith. Will Smith is on a rarefied path defensively where he was below average when he came up and now he's above average. Like he improved in every facet of his game defensively as a catcher. I think Ohapi can improve marginally, but like Will Smith is the like gold example of defensive improvement year by year as a catcher. And like, I think that's a very, very high standard to set for Ohapi. I think he can be a subdued version of that, which is a really good catcher. But like, I don't know. That that feels a little like almost too far. You know what I mean? I'm reaching for the stars with him. Yeah, for I sure. I totally understand that. But I'm also looking at a guy who's 24 where I believe in the bat. And I just feel like with the right coaching, at least we can improve this arm. And we can improve the pitch framing, not to how Will Smith has done. But the reason I brought it up is it's been done. It's not impossible. Yeah. So that's why I just wanted to say, if Ohapi can improve like Smith did on defense, which is asking a lot, definitive top five catcher. If he improves half of what Will Smith did, definitive top 10 catcher. Like, the guy's just a very good play- baseball player. Noted. Okay, last series, save the best for last. Dodgers, Yankees, Sunday Night Baseball is happening right now as we record. Game one went the Dodgers' way. Dodgers have already won the series. 2-1 in 11. Yamamoto gave us the best start of his major league career to this point. Yoshinobu Yamamoto in the Bronx, seven shutout. You were there. Yeah, Cody Petit sucked. made it a duel. Yeah, it sucked. Yeah, that game sucked. I mean... <laughs> I'm so excited. It's Yankees Dodgers. It's Friday night in the Bronx and it's zero zero until the 11th. How can you not love that? You no, know, like I, when I go to games, I don't really care unless I'm like behind home plate or really close to the pitcher. Then I'll enjoying it. I was in 227 B. I mean, I'm down on the second level. It's so hard to really watch these guys pitch 
So if I'm sitting there, and it's also Yankees Dodgers, like, yeah, I cover baseball. I love pitching, but damn it, I want runs. I want to see Otani hit one 450 feet. I want to see Judge hit one. I want to see Stan. I want to see Mookie. I want to see Freddie. I want to see Will Smith. And I get a Cody Petit shutout and a Yamamoto shutout. And I can't really see how the pitches are moving. So, no, I truthfully did not enjoy watching, like, these starters dice up. Can I throw you a name that you didn't say just now? Uh, Teoscar Hernandez broke up the scoreless tie in the top of the 11th with a two-run double. Do you know why I'm glad that you brought him up and I didn't bring him up? He's created an enemy with me. You don't like him anymore. Nope. You don't come into my stadium and dominate my team like that and me like you you now? You signed Teoscar for half the money you were going to give to Soto. You were going to give Soto 500, give Teoscar 250. This dickhead comes in. (laughs) Not only... He went two for four the first game, two for four the second game, and then he started the game off with a hit, and then we started pressing the record button. So I wasn't able to watch the rest. But God damn it, this guy just freaking annihilated us. So two annoying. One. I know. 2-1 in game one. Dodgers took it in 11. Yamamoto, seven shutout. Petit made a duel scoreless through 10. A two-run double from Teoscar. Judge had an RBI in the bottom of the 11th, but not enough. Game two, Teoscar again. 11-3, the Dodgers won. Four in the eighth, three in the ninth for the Dodgers. Teoscar had a grand slam and a six RBI day in a multi-homer game. Aaron Judge also had a multi-homer game. Judge is going to step up. Judge is a freakazoid. I I put out the note since May 1, like everything that he leads in. You're you're falling in love with this guy. I'm already in love, man. How can you, like, what does the process of falling in love look like when we're watching, like, one of the best hitters of the generation at the peak? Like, this is beyond peak of powers type shit. He's got a 1466, I think, OPS since May 1st. 1466. Going on five weeks of that. He's he's unconscious. He, I just smile. The I mean, thing is, like, just... it's one thing if it's a random that is unconscious, and it's like, oh, he's just having an out of body experience. We know this guy's fucking amazing. So, like, the thing is, there there's traces of validity to this, and it's not sustainable. But like, I'm sure the expected numbers speak to the same old thing because no, he hit the ball 105 every time. You know, he's underperforming his advanced metrics. There you go, man. Like, he's he's killing everything, everything, and some of the at bats. Like, I think it was in, um, I mean, I was there. It might have been the ninth inning or something. Blake Trinan comes in to face Judge. And you know how much I love Blake Trinan. I mean, there's some times where I'm like, you're the best reliever ever. I mean, it's the turbo sinker, the slider. Obviously, he's not the best reliever ever. But when I watch him, I'm always just amazed by his stuff and what he can do with such a, I mean, it barely looks like he's throwing. It looks like he's throwing batting practice in the sense of like his delivery is so smooth and so effortless. And then it's just 97 turbos with just a hammer. Um, Where was I going with that? (laughs) Oh, yeah. The at-bat with Judge. I think it was a 9 or 10 pitch at-bat works a walk. Like that kind of stuff nobody really cares about because it's just a walk in his stat department. But going in in that situation to draw a walk right there, that's when you know. Elite of the elite. Can I get my Yankee takeaway now? Oh, Sorry, no. Judge, Judge just homered again. <laughs> Six four Yankees in the eighth. Judge just hit number twenty four. Literally just now. Oh, and oh by the way, Teoscar Hernandez is two for four with a double and a homer tonight. Yeah, screw, screw him. Um, yeah, I just got the alert. All right, oh, he's the best. Um, I have a negative thing about the Yankees. Okay. So, I brought this up before, but I haven't really gone through it. The Yankees have a first base issue. They really do. Addison, who runs our Twitter, or is one of the runners of our Twitter, Yankees World on Twitter. That's his personal account. He's awesome. Anthony Rizzo in his last 455 plate appearances compared to Jose Abreu in his last 474 plate appearances. Who do you think has more home runs, Jack? I don't know. Abreu has 19. Rizzo has eight. Wow. Who do you think has more doubles? Oh, well, now Abreu. Abreu, 17 to 13. 
Who do you think's hitting for a higher average? Not a Brave. A Brave's hitting 224, Rizzo 205. Wow. Who do you think is the higher OBP? Rizzo. 281 for Rizzo, 278 for Abreu. Higher slug. Uh, Abreu, given the information. 399. Rizzo slugging 295. No way. OPS. You know it's Abreu now because of the slug and stuff. 677 OPS, Rizzo 596. Wow. Do you know what their WRC plus difference is? Abreu's Abreu's at 86. Rizzo is at 68. Wow. Rizzo has a negative 1.1 F4 to Abreu at negative 0.8. Abreu was sent down to the minor leagues. Now, Rizzo, you could tell he's the leader in this clubhouse. I mean, Judge, obviously, is the captain. But Rizzo just kind of feels like the glue. Talking to everybody, just like a, cl- a clubhouse legend. Everybody loves him. And I love him. But damn it, at some point something's got to change. And I don't know what it is. I don't have a solution right now. But I wanted to bring it up to put things in perspective here that Rizzo does a lot of good, but this version of Anthony Rizzo is almost unplayable. Damn. That hurts. Um, it does. By the way. I love Rizzo. Who homered tonight off Tyler Glass now? Do you see? No, I didn't say we've been recording. Two homers. Yeah, I'm not sure if you checked the box. Oh. Two homers against Tyler Glasnow. Glasnow punched out 12. Oswaldo Cabrera and oh, Trent Grisham homered against Tyler Glasnow. Fifth hole Trent Grisham. People, People are talking about That's the roundup. That's, That's the weekend roundup. Hopefully everybody enjoyed. Hopefully my takes weren't too bad. I am under the weather, but I appreciate everybody listening. Please rate and review five stars. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the best way to support this show. And hit that big red subscribe button on YouTube. Also, get yourself some Just Baseball merch. You know I'm rocking mine. Jack's obviously not rocking his. Hates the company, but that's okay. Don't be like Jack. Go get your Just Baseball merch in the episode description. You need tickets? Game time. Code Just Baseball. You want to bet? Bet MGM. Code Just Baseball. For Jack McGullen, I am Peter Apple. Of course, we'll be back tomorrow. With that, thank you, everybody.